ಭಗವತಿ ವೈಷ್ಣವ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ says here is the best of all knowledge so knowledge it has value when it allows us to achieve something with it we okay? think like wow the best of all knowledge might be you know, what are the next lottery numbers because with that I can win a lot of money and that might you know we think oh then I can get some happiness out of that but we know actually Even the lottery winners are very unhappy. <laughs> the study said over half of them wish they never won it. Because it comes with so much stress and anxiety. So the point is, knowledge that allows us to achieve something determines its value. So, um, this knowledge, Krishna is saying, all the sages, all the very righteous, pious, spiritual people. What have they done with this knowledge, Krishna says? Have attained supreme perfection. So how many of us want perfection of life? All of us? We all want perfection of life. 
And Krishna is going to tell us that in order to find it, one must transcend the modes of material nature. Because the three modes of material nature which permeate the material world are creating a set of bondage which keeps everyone here in a cycle of birth, death, old age, and disease. And Krishna has already told us in the eighth chapter, from the highest planet in the material realm to the lowest, it is a place of suffering. The Kali. And it is a Shasatam, temporary. So, if the three modes of nature are permeating it throughout the material creation, and throughout the material world we see this Dukkala, this suffering and difficulty, then what is the only means to attain perfection? How are we going to attain perfection? If the three modes are full of suffering, what do you detach think? from that. You have to detach from that. So Krishna is going to teach us how to get transcend, to go beyond the three modes, to go above and beyond. Transcend means to elevate it, and to get above. And so Krishna in this chapter is going to explain what in good detail, what are these three modes? This mode of goodness, this mode of passion, and this mode of ignorance. And he's going to speak on how these modes, they bind us to the material world. We spoke last time that we're bound to the material world. But unfortunately, we don't see like shackles, right? <laughs> we don't see it. And we're not bound by gravity. Oh, if we just broke gravity, we could then all of a sudden go to a different doesn't work that way. We are bound by these three modes. And the problem is, we don't see that we're bound. And what happens when we don't see that we're bound? We become illusion. We become illusion. And we make no effort to become unbound. Because <laughs> I don't see that I'm bound. Right? The, the example of how foolish it is for us not to see that we are bound is the same of a prisoner in a prison house who doesn't realize that he's bound in the prison and that there is a whole other realm outside of the prison house. But this prisoner is so conditioned by life in the prison that has no concept of what exists outside and thus makes no effort to even get out now, would we consider that very wise? Would anybody consider such a prisoner very wise? Huh? Right? So, a prisoner in a prison house, we know, what is their number one objective? What is their first and foremost objective? Not to leave them out. <laughs> get out. <laughs> get out. Yeah. Get out. They want to get out. But what if a prisoner transcends the modes and accepting the position as a prisoner? Can he find liberation as a prisoner? And oh, sort of that's that's Krishna is going to tell us that transcending the modes doesn't necessarily mean leaving the material world. So one can transcend the modes by uh, becoming unaffected by the modes. So when we talk about liberation. Liberation, mukti, does not mean to go to some other realm. It means to take our consciousness to a higher platform. It's to become free from these three modes. So yes, that term is called jivan mukta. One who is even within this body, within the material world, can become liberated. And become free from the modes. And Krishna is going to explain how that happens. And it happens, hint, hint, hint. By the practice of bhakti, by the practice of devotional service, one can become free from the modes, uh, even within this body, even while living within this material world, which is likened to the prison. But the, the key is one must see that there is a greater opportunity, that there is something beyond 
the three modes. Because the modes are set up such, there's a mode of ignorance, and higher than that is mode of passion, and higher than that is mode of goodness. goodness. Now, if I've come to the mode of goodness, and all I know is passion and ignorance, what is the problem with that mode of goodness? You're still bound to it. I'm still bound to it. But because I see, well, I'm better off than those in the mode of passion and those in the mode of ignorance, then I make no effort to go beyond, to transcend, to get even beyond the mode of goodness. So I compare myself. Hey, I've got a pretty good life in this material world. That's like a, you know, an A-class prisoner who's got a, you know, the biggest cell, maybe the thickest mattress, maybe they have a TV in their prison cell. Like, wow, I've got, I've got, this is the life. Because everybody else doesn't have this. And obviously, somebody sitting outside of us say, wow, what a foolish person. There's so much more to experience. So one bound by even the mode of goodness in the material world is still struggling for existence within this very you know, difficult place, full of dukkha and temporary manifestations. So Krishna is going to say, it's not sufficient just to come to the mode of goodness. One must, from there, transcend. So the whole goal of this chapter is going to teach us what are the modes, how do they bind us, how they are affecting us, and how we very practically can change our activities so that we can move ultimately to the mode of goodness and from there transcend to pure goodness. And that is where devotional service bhakti resides. So in the practice of devotional service, one is entering the realm of pure devotional service. So <clears throat> this is how this knowledge leads one to achieve supreme perfection. There is no perfection to be found within the three modes. There is no perfection to be found within the three modes. Because even full of mode of goodness, one will still find birth, death, old age, disease, difficulties of the mind and body, of different living entities, of natural disturbances, will be influenced by Maya, the illusory energy. And while situated in goodness, eventually will be tempted by some other desires, and will fall from that position, Shri Prabhupada speaks so. So it's not a position that one can find perfection. The perfection position is by transcend. Okay? So let's read the second verse, and we'll discuss a little bit about that. Um, that Christian now introduces us in the beginning of the second chapter. So we'll read the second verse. By becoming fixed in this knowledge, one can attain the transcendental nature like my own. Thus established, one is not born at the time of creation or disturbed at the time of dissolution. After acquiring perfect transcendental knowledge, one acquires qualitative equality with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, becoming free from the repetition of birth and death. One does not, however, lose his identity as an individual soul. It is understood from Vedic literature that the liberated souls who have reached the transcendental planets of the spiritual sky always look to the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord, being engaged in his transcendental loving service. So even at liberation, the, devotee, the devotees do not lose their individual identities. Generally, the material world Whatever knowledge we get in this contaminated by the three modes of nature, three, three modes of material nature, <clears throat> knowledge which is not contaminated by the three modes of nature is called conditional knowledge. Sorry, trans, sorry, transitional knowledge. As soon as one is situated in the transitional knowledge, he is on the same platform as the Supreme Person. Those who, those who have no knowledge of the spiritual, spiritual sky hold of, sorry, sky hold that after being free from the material activity of material, material activities of the material form, this spiritual identity became formless without any virgin, virginatingness. However, just as there is a 
uh, material very finiteness in the world in this world in the spiritual world there is also a virginate virginateness there is uh, those in the uh, ignorance of this thing that spiritual existence is opposed by the material vari variant but actually in the spirit in, in the spiritual sky one attains a spiritual form there are there are spiritual activities and the spiritual situation is is called devotional life that atmosphere is said to be a unconditional and uncondemned sorry uncontaminated and there is and and there one is equal to quality quality with this supreme lord to attain such knowledge one must develop all the spiritual qualities one who does develop this spiritual quality is not affected either by the creation or by the destruction of the material world so here <clears throat> krishna explains now what the so krishna said in the prior verse all sages achieve perfection okay? but now he's describing specifically what is the result of this knowledge so krishna says by becoming fixed in this knowledge what happens what is the result of becoming fixed in this knowledge? You become qualitatively equal to him. Okay. And? Can you? He gives Krishna the birth. He gives Krishna the truth. Yes. So he gets, he's he reaches Krishna's abode, right? So, to attain the transcendental nature like my own. So, he achieves a very similar state to Krishna. And he achieves the spiritual abode. Right? So Prabhupada in the very opening sentence says, Okay, well then we must know what is the spiritual abode like? Is it just another prison house? Or is it something different? Does it have some better qualities? Because if it doesn't, then why one would aspire to go there, right? There must be something there that's superior to here for us to aspire to reach that abode. Otherwise, what would be the point? Right? So, Prabhupada, in the opening sentence of the opening uh, purport, the first sentence, he explains a very important feature of the spiritual world. And what is the spiritual, what is what, the important feature, Prabhupada tells us? Everyone always looks to the lotus feet of the mm -hmm. Lord and acts in, and engages in devotional loving service. Okay, so that's the activity. But what is the spiritual world? In the very first sentence, he tells us. There is no repetition of birth. Maybe, yeah. No Maybe repetition yeah. of birth and death. Is that not the goal of every single person? To be eternal? To not die? <laughs> At least most people, we can say. Right? That is the goal. Something that is eternal. Because what happens with death is all the things that we've worked so hard to accumulate in relation to this body, whoosh, gone. One fell swoop. Gone. Our home, family, wealth, fame, status, all the things we've worked And so, we live in some level, maybe a high level, low level, but of worry about losing everything. But in the spiritual world, does one ever lose anything? Everything is free from birth and death, old age, disease. There are no difficulties. It is by kunta. Kunta means miseries, and by means none. Without, there are no means. None. So, the by becoming fixed in this knowledge, one can achieve this state of no miseries, no difficulties, perfection of life. 
Sound interesting to anyone? Well, in order to achieve it, one must transcend the three modes. Because wherever the three modes are present, one will find this birth, death, old age, disease, adhyatmi, tadimoti, tadimedi, these threefold miseries. There is no escaping them. Just as if you jump into a pool, there's no escaping water, from becoming wet, you can't escape it. Similarly, as soon as you're conditioned by the three modes, these things are guaranteed. But if one understands how to get beyond the three modes, then one can achieve the transcendental nature of the Supreme Lord. Right? So then, um, uh, Prabhupada begins to speak, that he does not lose his identity with the as the individual soul. Why does Prabhupada make this point, do you think? What's the importance of this point? Is it to signify the constitutional position between the individual soul and Sri Krishna? Yeah. It indicates that there's an eternal relationship between us and the soul and Krishna that exists in the spiritual world. And what is that relationship? As a servant to Krishna. As a servant to Krishna. And what is the eternal activity of the soul in the spiritual world? Transcendental loving service. Yeah. Bhakti, devotional Bhakti. service. Loving service to Krishna. That is the eternal activity. And what is the result for this individual in performing that activity? What results? Liberation. Liberation. But if liberation doesn't accompany this feature, then liberation has no value. What is it? Ultimate peace and happiness. Right? Just being free from the prison house doesn't give happiness. It's the activities that one can perform outside the prison that gives one happiness. Right? So the source of happiness is not being in the spiritual world. The source of happiness is being able to render devotional service to Krishna. That is what gives happiness. And the beauty of the spiritual world when we go to render devotional service, we are unlimited. No backaches. No, I can't get up for Mangal Arati because I need more rest. No, oh, there's not pink flowers for the garland I'd like to make for Krishna. Or I really would love to offer Krishna these nice, you know, uh, pineapples, but I only have apples. No. Unlimited resources in an eternal form in which one can render service to Krishna without any interruption. And when one renders service to Krishna uninterruptedly, there is an experience of incalculable bliss and happiness. So the happiness is not going to the spiritual world. The happiness is being able to serve in the spiritual world without any limitations. Anybody would like to serve like that? <laughs> we lament, right? Sometimes on big festival days, oh, I'm so tired, I can't do fasting, I want to do this service, I wish this kirtan wouldn't end, you know, oh, this prashadam is so nice, I wish I could eat five plates. We have all these, because we are limited by our form, by our body. But in the spiritual world, we retain our identity. So, and the reason Prabhupada makes this point is very important. Because many um, so-called spiritual philosophers suggest that liberation means that we lose our individual identity. That we merge into some you know, energy. That is liberation. That is actually a very common conception of liberation. But actually in that state, we then lose our ability to engage in any activity. And that activity in loving service to Krishna is what gives so much bliss and happiness. So Krishna Prabhupada is establishing that in the spiritual world, 
very important, we maintain our individuality. Right? So, and then he goes into the very next sentence. What does a living entity do as an individual in the spiritual world? We kind of already discussed it, but it's worth discussing again and again. What do they do? What is the eternal activity of the soul in the spiritual world? Devotional service. Right? Prabhupada says, Look to the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord, being engaged in His transcendental loving service. Okay? So this is the eternal activity. And all of this knowledge that Krishna is going to give in this chapter is going to bring us to this state of becoming free from the modes and being able to engage in devotional service uninterruptedly in the spiritual world. And the result of which is pure bliss and happiness. Right? So, now, next Prabhupada is, is, is calibrating the knowledge. Right? So, is there any shortage of knowledge out there? How much knowledge can you find on Google? Can you get to the end of the internet? Can you get to the end of Wikipedia? There's so much knowledge out there. But, what and what is the goal ultimately of all knowledge? Why do we acquire knowledge? To be successful. To be successful. And how do we define success? Ultimately. Material world wealth. But even wealth, why does one want wealth? Pleasant to be to have a pleasing circumstance to have peace and happiness, right? So every goal, both the spiritualist and materialist, have the same goal. It's not a different goal. Everyone has the same objective: peace and happiness. Nobody's looking for unhappiness. So everyone's acquiring knowledge to try to find peace and happiness. How can I manipulate this? How can I do this? What? All searching for knowledge. But the problem that Prabhupada establishes here is that when knowledge is conditioned by the three modes, it means that the knowledge is on the bodily platform. And so what kind of happiness can result from that knowledge? always has to be temporary. And why does it have to be temporary? Because everything material is temporary. You may understand how to make a million dollars. But will that wealth last you the next thousand years? No. Because when you finish with this body, you don't get to take it with you. Done. You may learn how to sing very beautifully and become a famous singer. Will you be able to take that fame with you for the next 500 years? And so on. Every piece of knowledge that relates to the body is ultimately going to end. And thus it won't give that happiness. Because when we know it's going to end, when we are enjoying it, we'll always have this fear. And what is that fear? That we're going to fail. And we're going to lose it. And we're going to lament it. Even when you're in the midst of enjoying it. We've all been on vacation, right? And you're on this wonderful vacation. And as you get towards like the middle or towards the end of your thing, you start to lament. And what is your lamentation? It's almost over. It's almost over. I passed the halfway point. I passed the three quarters way point. Oh, only one more day. Even in the midst of trying to enjoy it, because it ends, you can't fully enjoy it. And that is the nature of everything in the material world. So all this knowledge that's conditioned by the material world, it's not going to give the goal that we want. That's, it's not supreme perfection. Remember, the goal is the same. But knowledge is going to teach us how to eat nicely, sleep nicely, mate nicely, and defend nicely. These four things won't give happiness. So Prabhupada says that we have to acquire transcendental knowledge. And what makes it transcendental knowledge? Spiritual knowledge. Spiritual knowledge. 
And it's because spiritual knowledge has no tinge of anything material. It has nothing to do with the body. It has nothing to do with the body. It all has to do with the soul. Soul. Right? So transcendental knowledge speaks about what is good for the soul. Material knowledge speaks about what is good for the body. 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 So what's more important? Rupa always gives the example of the car and the driver. Is it more important to acquire knowledge about your car or about the driver yourself? If the car is hungry and the driver is hungry, who are you going to feed first? The driver. Okay. When there's an accident on the road, what is our first focus of concern? The safety. Is the safety. Are the people inside safe? Right? So we always know the driver has a higher value and purpose than the vehicle. There's value to the vehicle. We do care about it. But it is in relation to the person. So when I'm going to seek knowledge, there's no limitation of knowledge out there. But what is the best use of my time in acquiring knowledge? Knowledge about my soul or knowledge about my body? Because if I start to acquire knowledge about the soul, I ultimately can find eternal peace and happiness. Perfection, right? But this is why Krishna has already given transcendental knowledge way back in the fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. But now he's getting more detail to explain everything here within the three modes of nature, right? And then Prabhupada begins to speak about some who have no knowledge of the spiritual sky, they suggest that everything is formless in the spiritual world. That there is no variety. Now how can that be? If there's form and variety in the material world, how can that not be in the spiritual world? Krishna is going to tell us in the next chapter that everything we see in the material world is just a re perverted reflection of the spiritual world. It's a reflection. So in a reflection, can you see anything in the reflection that doesn't exist in the original object by pure logic? Anything you can see in the reflection that doesn't exist in the object that's being reflected? By definition, you cannot, right? Because that is being reflected from the original. So whatever we see in this material world, it exists in its pure form in the spiritual world. So all of us are trying to find happiness through so many different means in, this, in the material world. But the activities of happiness, they exist actually in their purest form in the spiritual world. So there's unlimited variety in the spiritual world. So many different opportunities to engage in one activity. And what is that activity? Bhakti. Bhakti. Love and service to Krishna. But with endless varieties, endless opportunities to enjoy. And where the happiness and bliss is unending and incalculable. We cannot even wrap our hands. So there is extraordinary variety and opportunity, all centered around one single activity, and that is serving Krishna. He is the center of all activity. Right? So Prabhupada says, those in ignorance of this think that the spiritual existence is opposed to material variety. Meaning this idea of just merging into some you know, formless state that is not, there is an aspect of that in the spiritual sky that the full realization of this knowledge is to reach the spiritual abode of Krishna, where one can enjoy an endless variety of him. 
and that air, that atmosphere, Prabhupada says, uncontaminated in the house. So this is the knowledge um, that Krishna is going to be unfolding for us. How to find it? Because again, if the prisoner has no idea that there's a better opportunity outside the prison house, then they'll make no ende uh, endeavor to get out. Why bother? The only bother is if there's something better outside. And so, the living entity, we have been cycling through millions and millions of lifetimes, ignorant of the fact that the three modes of material nature are binding us to this material world and failing to realize that there is a better opportunity. And by the mercy of Shri Prabhupada, we are now coming to hear this knowledge directly from the Supreme Lord Himself. And He's telling us, there is a better opportunity for you. And if you transcend these modes, get beyond the modes, this amazing experience awaits all. And so that's what He'll begin to uh, unfold in the coming verses. Okay, so we'll uh, end here. Shri Prabhupada Ki any uh, questions or discussion, comments? Um, hmm. I had a comment because I had a thought about something the other day, but it was kind of kind of morbid here. Um, in terms of seeking perfection of life, if even in the mode of goodness, everything to an extent is contaminated. What would it then mean instead of trying to uh, pursue a perfect perfection in life, but with this knowledge you utilized it in perfection of death in terms of the physical exit to the next stage, whether it's rebirth or spiritual liberation? Yeah, I mean, Krishna speaks in the eighth chapter that, you know, in, as you, to use the word, said, in somewhat of a morbid terms, life is but a preparation for death. Right. Because at the end of this life, that if we think of Krishna at the time of death, we are guaranteed to achieve his eternal abode. Of this, he says, there is no doubt. No doubt. But the problem is, when is it coming? Yeah. And if I spent my whole life not thinking of Krishna, then how can I expect at that time, when their body is in so much distress and there's so much fear, and all the things I've been attached to, I face the reality I'm going to lose, how will I have any hope to think of Krishna? So the perfection of life is to think of Krishna at the end of it. But, when one begins to practice devotional service, one finds, well, wait a minute, I don't need to wait until the end of this life to experience the spiritual world. Actually, the bliss of the spiritual world can be had tomorrow, today, at this very next moment, in rendering pure devotional service. Because when one is engaged in devotional service, one is directly associated with the Supreme Lord. The jail. And so that happiness is immediately available. One doesn't have to wait until they transcend to some spiritual abode. Happens now. And that's why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Janani Jamini Shoreh. He says birth after birth. When he says birth after birth, it means he's not even looking to become free from birth. But what is he begging? Don't let me ever forget you, Krishna. Bless me with the opportunity to be your devotee. Because that's what's going to give me happiness. It doesn't matter where I am. It doesn't matter. To be in the spiritual world or the hellish finest or somewhere in between. 
But my greatest fear is somehow forgetting Krishna. Because if I forget Krishna, I will again swim in this ocean of misery. But as long as I am remembering Krishna, there is some happiness. So, while it starts out kind of morbid, when I have to die well, through the practice, one realizes, wait a minute, I don't need to wait. And that's why Krishna says, Brahma Bhutta Prasanatma. When one becomes self-realized, they immediately become joyful. No shotati na kaunchati. No more lamentation and no more hankering. No more, I wish I had this. I wish. Why? Because you have everything. Samasarveshu, Bhuteshu. You become the well-wisher and friend of everyone. But bhakti lavate param. And that state you achieve pure bhakti. So that happiness from bhakti is instant if we are practicing it according to Guru and Krishna. So we don't have to wait till some future state. And that is the ultimate benediction of Krishna uh, for all of us. That bhakti is instant results. Because we're we we want them fast. We don't want anything delayed. Any other questions or comments? Forgive you on another question. Um, the three modes of nature, right? Uh, ignorance. So the path to go to one to other is by spiritual. By what? By spiritual knowledge. Acquiring spiritual knowledge, you can move from one, one stage to other stage, right? Not necessarily spiritual knowledge, but we can say um, uh, knowledge of the modes themselves, because the modes are still mature, mm -hmm. right? So we can say like social codes and social moral conduct, mm -hmm. how to carry oneself well, right? Mode of goodness is basically good, pious activities, but it's all mature, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's better than being impious mm -hmm. and a rascal, but it's still going to make us an A-class prisoner, oh, okay. right? So it's not spiritual. Spiritual means you have a transcendental objective, Krishna. As soon as that, and where the confusion occurs, this is where all the confusion occurs. Most of the Vedas have to do with mode of goodness. All these karma kanda sacrifices. What are they for? What is the desired goal of all of those karma kanda sacrifices? Good material results. Some material results. Higher birth in a heavenly planet, some wealth. Nice spouse, nice this, nice mm -hmm. promotion, <clears throat> child, whatever it is. And all of that is on the material platform. Right? And that's why Krishna says in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, you rise above the fruits of the Vedas. that are only going to ensnare you in this material world. So all those karma come to sacrifice, all that is still within the material mode of goodness. It's not a okay. transcendental goal yet. And that's where the confusion comes. Okay. So bhakti is not in the mode of goodness. It is in the mode of pure goodness. Shuddha shatva. Pure goodness. So it is beyond the three modes. That's it. And we'll talk a little bit about more about that when we get into the details of each of these modes. So Krishna is going to give really nice detail now each of these modes as they progress. Okay. Thank you. It's okay? Yeah. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Then next week we'll begin uh, discussing check, uh, verse number three. Shri Prabhupada Ki Nanta Kuti Vaishalinda Now we'll chant our rounds.